and welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. Got another men's meeting today. We've got Brian and Carrie and Lou. Good to have you guys. Heard from Lori this morning. She's not going to be able to make it. Talking about the 36th verse of the Tao Te Ching. Before we go there, guys, any announcements, go to BuddyC.org. Got a lot of good resources there. There's a resources tab. There's a podcast tab with a number of podcasts of all different kinds, mostly recovery, but some spiritual ones as well. There's a sign up for a daily Tao devotion. I'm taking these ideas and thoughts that we talk about every week and taking one quote with a thought about the quote, usually matching it with a recovery related quote, uh, and then a description of love and an affirmation. So if that's something that interests you, go to buddyc.org. Keep in mind on those, I'm using this sign up as a way to keep me accountable to write. So you will see some errors in those. Uh, quotes they have not been to the editor yet so just keep in mind if you see something that's incorrect trust me i see it i find it uh, or the editor finds it just hope you enjoy those uh, the uh, it's really helping me to stay accountable and keep writing so thank you the 36th verse of the Tao Te Ching let's start with Lou will you read the Stephen Mitchell Translation for us, please, sir. Sure. If you want to shrink something, you must first allow it to expand. If you want to get rid of something, you must first allow it to flourish. If you want to take something, you must first allow it to be given. This is called the subtle perception of the way things are. The soft overcomes the hard. The slow overcomes the fast. Let your workings remain a mystery. Just show people the results. Thank you, Lou. I'll go ahead and read the Jonathan Starr. Contraction pulls at that which extends too far. Weakness pulls at that which strengthens too much. Ruin pulls at that which rises too high. Loss pulls at life when you fill it with too much stuff. The lesson here is called the wisdom of obscurity. The gentle outlast the strong. The obscure outlasts the obvious. Hence, a fish that ventures from deep water is soon snagged by a net. A country that reveals its strength is soon conquered by an enemy. It's Jonathan Starr, Translations and Commentary. Brian, you have Jeff Pepper? Yeah, I've got the Jeff Pepper, Dow Day Ching in clear English. It says, uh, when you want to draw something in, you must first stretch it out. When you want to weaken something, you must first make it strong. When you want to abandon something, you must first promote it. When you want to seize something, you must first give it something. This is subtle wisdom. Soft and weak conquers hard and strong. Fish can't escape from deep waters. The sharp tools of the nation can't be shown to the people. Thank you, Brian. Any comments? Carrie, we don't see you too often. We expect a lot of commenting out of you today, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, my mind instantly goes to the end of what Brian just read. Not the beginning. The beginning part seems to make sense, but the end about the fish and the weapons just kind of seems disjointed with the rest of the the verse. I don't yeah, understand I, it. I like the way that Stephen Mitchell, I think you guys all have the, can have the Stephen Mitchell in front of you. If you need the link, let me know. It says that if you want to sh shrink, if you want to shrink something, it doesn't say you stretch it. It says you must first allow it to expand, which is totally different. You allowing is different from you making. I picked up on that, buddy. Allow is through throughout that verse. Yeah. Yeah. Allow to flourish, allow to be given. Yeah. 
we have to let go of the control. How many times w- was that not if we relate this to recovery? I, For me to find my bottom, it took allowing. I had to find that for myself. I see people come into recovery all the time. This is the classic. What I see is the way that happens. The person comes in, they're getting their paper signed because they got into some legal trouble. They're not listening much. They're getting their paper signed, heading out, paper signed, heading out. They get through their trouble. You don't see them again for a while. Then wait, didn't you come a couple of years ago? They're back again getting their paper signed. This time they might be listening a little more. This time they might even get a sponsor. This time they might be in drug court where they have to have a sponsor so they get one. Doesn't mean they work the program, but they start getting the things that, you know, what people say. That might go on. And then when they get through drug court and all the, th- get everybody off their behind, you don't see them again for a while. Then again, you see them back a couple of years later. And a lot of times by now, they're like, I was made to come here. I didn't want to get sober, so I just did the minimal. Now I'm ready. And they're really whipped. I had I knew one guy, I know one guy in AA that his bottom was writing some drunk emails to his boss. <laughs> that was enough for him. That sounds like you, Carrie. That's something Carrie would do, real high bottom. But this guy, that was enough for him to get sober. And he's been sober, gosh, almost as long as I have, just off of drunk emails. <laughs> I had to get to the point where I always understood the first part of step one, powerless. I had to get to that point. I'd allow that to happen. I didn't understand the second part of the statement, life would become unmanageable. But I knew enough that I had no other choices. So I allowed that to happen where it's <laughs> I'm tired of the hangovers and tired of feeling sick all the time. I was sick of being sick and you know, once I allowed that to happen, I was able to learn the second part of it. You know, it's that awareness, Carrie, that's so that we can be grateful for. But for each of us, we have to be allowed to find that place. And that's where the Al Anon stuff comes in, doesn't it, Lou? This is very this is a very Al Anon verse. It is. And I was just thinking of my low voice point that got me into Al Anon. It was when I finally realized that didn't matter what kind of logical argument I provided for our, our son, that it wasn't sufficient to, um, I couldn't talk him into sobriety. I couldn't, I couldn't manipulate him into sobriety. And I'd run out of things to do. I didn't know where to go, what to do about that. Didn't know what to do about the feelings I had related to it. Trying to push the river. Yes. Yes. I'm not sure. I, w- I found it surprising when I first joined AA that one of the one of the things that someone might tell somebody is if you're not sure about no- step number one, go out and experiment some more. Try some controlled drinking. Like they tell you to go find your bottom and come back when now that you know what you know. At the first of the pandemic, we had we had a new AA meeting going. It's, it's still going actually. It's the fourth dimensioners, 9 p.m. every night Eastern. Uh, get there at zoomameetings.com. Actually, that link will take you straight there. When we were first starting the meeting, there was a guy, and he's, uh, he's a regular in the meeting and very involved. Been sober since the pandemic started. He asked one of the first meetings, he asked, I don't know if I'm an alcoholic or not. And this was after the meeting because we have a little meeting after the meeting a lot of times before and after and i told him i said steve uh, steven why don't you uh, go drink some more and see and everybody attacked me they're like what are you saying you can't suggest he go drink I'm like, and they were all just they would attack me if we'd have been in person and i said whoa wait a minute i said the, the big book truly clearly tells us to make that suggestion uh, we have to be convinced. It even goes as far as to say it's worse. It's worth a case of the jitters to find out. 
Uh, and it actually talks about alcohol being, I believe it calls it the great convincer. It uses some verbiage there to mean that, hey, it's alcohol that convinces you. It's nothing else. It's alcohol that convinces you that you're an alcoholic. That could be used with all kinds of things, but they got all over me for that. I've had sponsees before that were, I said, you have such a pity party. I'll spot you $20 if you need it. So you get this out of your system. No, no, no. I don't want to go drink. I said, okay, then let's get started. We've been a candy ass. There was another guy. No, they told him, he said, you're whining so much. We're going to put some, what is it? Some oil rags timed to your ankles to keep the bugs from eating your candy ass. <laughs> You've heard that one, hadn't you, Brian? That's a southern. That, that's actually a South Florida. This guy was down in South Florida. They said, "Have some oil rags on your ankles." <laughs> yeah, Florida. That's a whole new level. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, but it's really true that we have to be to the point to where we're convinced that whatever it is that's driving our addictive behavior that we've had enough we've got to hit that bottom we've got to allow that to happen that's hard for our loved one when we see our loved ones in that situation but we have to we have to i don't know if it's anything um, but it's an on thing to allow people the dignity of their own desperation that there's dignity in getting that desperate to find your way out if, if they don't have that lou uh they can never start to climb out. That's right. It's impossible. And on the L9 side, we find out that our life is unmanageable because we're trying to, <laughs> we're, we're seeing that we're not managing anybody else's lives and uh, we're also not managing our own. Yeah. If the real problem is not the alcoholic either. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, oh, that's good. That's good. We're not trying to fix it for them. You're actually harming them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And harming yourself. Yeah. yeah. That's just the symptom. All around, it's just the symptom. It's not the real problem, see. As Mitchell would say, it's the it's called the subtle perception of the way things are. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's the way things are. You can't make it otherwise. You can allow it or you can fight and it's not going to work. And he's talking about... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, it reminds me of a book I read when I first had children. It's called Positive Reinforcement. And... It talked about when you raise your kids, allow them to experience natural consequences and logical consequences. You know, it sounds like almost a Trinity prayer. Some, in some areas, you got to let them, you know, if they don't eat their dinner, then when they come back later, they're hungry. You're like, I bet you are. You didn't eat your dinner. <laughs> it's a natural consequence, and they learn from that. But then sometimes things are so bad, you can't let them, like, you can't let them walk in the street and learn, you know, that. So you got to develop a logical consequence. Um, so just kind of this verse kind of reminds me of that a little bit. It doesn't talk as much about the logical consequence part, but you know, just letting people figure stuff out for themselves, even your kids. Yeah. It's interesting, too, how it's all of the extremes. If you want to shrink something, if you want to get rid of something, if you want to take something. So it's not... You know, all of these situations, we have to allow it. We have to allow. Shrink that ego. Yes. Mm. Get rid of something. We allow it to flourish. If we want to take something or if we would like to have something in our life, we would have to first allow it to be given. I think we've talked about that before as it relates to business. <laughs> oh, that's a, yes. That works in business. You can't. Uh... You can't take their business from them. They have to, you have to allow them to give it to you. Yes. Yes. You, and the way that I allow is how can I be helpful to them? How can I be helpful in your business? If, uh, and I've had competitors in the past that I've had to pray for their business to flourish. That can be hard, but that's the allowing because I quit fighting it. The, the whole issue is my fight because this is all talking to me with you. If you, this is all talking to me. Uh, 
And it says it's the subtle perception of the way things are, not how you want them to be, but this is how it is. We have to allow. That's first. We can't fight anymore. And that goes so much along with page 84 in the big book. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. Continuing to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately. Make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code, and we have ceased fighting anything and anyone, even alcohol. You could continue to read there. Uh, by this time, sanity's return will seldom be interested in liquor. Uh, goes on to say that we're in a place of neutrality, safe and secure. But all this happens because we start allowing. We stop the fight. We stop pushing. And this is a, <clears throat> we use page 84 in the big book a lot. This is the 10th step. When we have things come up in everyday life, we watch for selfishness, honesty, and resentment, which for me, I think, are the only tools that fear has in our life is selfishness, dishonesty, and resentment. When these crop up, if you didn't believe a God out there would remove something, what you could do instead is just ask that they be removed. And what happens for me, the way those are removed, I have to take some loving action some compassionate action, which causes those things to be removed in my life. That's how it works. I can just ask that they be removed. I discuss them with someone immediately. I'm making them in quickly if I've harmed anyone. Notice the urgency there. I ask God at once. I discuss them with someone immediately. I'm making amends quickly. Then I resolutely turn my thoughts to someone I can help. So I turn my thoughts. It doesn't mean I stop what I'm doing and go help someone. I turn my thoughts. I could do this whole process in less than 60 seconds. I see that I've my dishonesty has popped up, usually because I'm afraid of something. I've lied about something. Right? If I look deep enough, there's fear behind that. Okay. Oh, shit. I lied about that. All right. Well, I need to make that right. I ask that be removed and the action I take is what removes it really I go and I make that right I'm already letting compassion have its way in my life it's already starting to be removed I tell my sponsor about it I can just text him and say fear page 84 and he knows what's going on I don't have to stop and talk to him I can do that then it says that we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Usually this is a repeat thing over and over for me. And I already have someone that I know that I can pray for because I asked, I said, who can I pray for that's going through a similar thing? So I have that person in my life and then I would pray for them when I get in the situation that I'm in. When that character defect shows itself, I usually have someone that I'm already praying for that. If it's new, then I say, okay, who can I pray for with this? Because in recovery, we know all kinds of screwed up people. So everybody, we can know somebody has got almost any issue going on. And so I can pray for that person. I have that one specific person I pray for as if I were going to pray for me. I pray for them in the same fervency in the same way. And as a result of that, love and tolerance can be our code for everyone in working the 10th step. And we've ceased fighting because we're practicing this program. You know, I hear people pull that phrase out, well, love and tolerance is our code about anything. Well, wait a minute. It's not talking about everything. It's talking about in working the 10th step, love and tolerance is our code granted of everyone, but we have also stopped fighting. We've stopped fighting ourselves. We stop fighting people because we're practicing this 10th step in our life. That's the only time when we can get in a place of neutrality. That's the only place that I can really allow people to be themselves is when I'm right. -sized. So for me in this, if I'm wanting something to go away and I'm not allowing, 
there's the, the problem is my not allowing in this verse. So the question would be, what am I fighting? What am I trying to stretch? What am I trying to get rid of? What am I trying to take? And if I'm not allowing, then it's not going to work. I'm going to be in angst. I'm going to be upset. And it's all because of my control of things I should be allowing. Brian mentioned the ego on that. I was trying to apply the ego to that, to the verse. Yeah. It sounded kind of counterintuitive. I'm not sure. I, it sounds like let it get bigger <laughs> before it gets smaller. But I guess it's the same thing. Right? You got to learn. You allow yourself to learn how your ego is. How about this, Brian? Carrie, how about this? Well, let, me, let me buddy in real quick. Full disclosure, I, I got that from my uh, from my Derek Lynn that's annotated and explained. So I always like to go to his stuff and kind of see what his comments are on it. So <laughs> you want to share those with us, Brian? Yeah, I'd be glad to. It just says, it's talking about the first, first part. It says, uh, the classical example of this process is pride goeth before the fall. Consider what happens when a promising actor is surrounded by S-Y-C-O-P-H-A-N-T-S. I've never heard that word. But anyway, uh, they expand and strengthen his ego with endless flattery. He becomes disconnected from reality and believes he could do no wrong. Soon the bubble bursts and his projects collapse. His spectacular failures shrink and weaken his ego. In the meantime, another rising star assembles an entourage and the process starts all over again. What Where's comes that, Brian? What's that? It's the Derek Lynn. Thank you. What comes up for me, buddy, is those seasons me and you talked about. Everything has a season. Every dog has his day. Reminds me too, Brian, that we have to stop the fight. We have to stop resisting. Because in the second step, I learned that what I resist persists. Got that from our Scottish friend, Craig. You'll love it. I mentioned him on the podcast. <laughs> what resist persists. If we're resisting, we're not allowing. And I find just like Mitchell says the soft overcomes the hard. When I stop fighting and just allow, that's where my strength is. When I stopped fighting alcohol, what the program did, it gave me the tools to stop fighting and to actually surrender to alcohol. It wasn't that I came to AA and then God got on my side and helped me with my alcoholism, which is what I thought would be. That's how I thought life was. God gave me the strength I didn't have. There was no surrender there whatsoever in my prior ideas of how this would work. And when in time and recovery, I realized that my strength was made perfect in weakness. My strength was in stopping the resistance stop allow just stop fighting and when i quit fighting alcohol i found that the cravings left and there was strength there that was not there in my fight i don't understand how that works but it's very much like paul talked about in the thorn in the flesh he said uh, my strength's made perfect in weakness. The weaker I get, the stronger I become. Hmm. And that's the same thing I think that he's talking about here. That's how the soft overcomes the hard. The slow overcomes the fast. That's the mystery that cannot be explained. I don't think I have not been able to explain it. I don't know how it works. I just know when I stop fighting, and stop resisting that whatever issue I'm dealing with is dealt with for me. I don't understand that. I don't know how that works. And my question for me is not that I stop fighting and do nothing. My efforts go in a different direction. Now my efforts would go toward, okay, 
How can I see gratitude in this? How can I get compassion into this situation? The, if I'm dealing with a person, what am I appreciative of in this person? What is it that I appreciate in this person? See how that shift of how can I make them do what they need to do? That shift changes. I, I've even used that with sponsees before. I had a sponsee that was really hung up on something back during the pandemic. It was funny. He was in California and he didn't like the idea of wearing masks in public. And there was this $800 fine or something for wearing a mask, not wearing a mask in public. I told him to move, but he didn't want to move. So it's good advice. Yeah. Well, he said, he said, I just, I said, I said, you've got two choices. You can either wear a mask or get your $800 ready and not wear a mask and be willing to pay the fine. Well, I don't want to. I said, that's not a choice. I said, you can do this without being angry, without fighting it. You don't have to fight this. Well, I'm going to go protest. I said, you can go protest. I said, but you can do it without anger. You don't have to fight this. Hmm. Because the fight is not helping you. I said, just let it go. Pray for those folks. They think they're doing the best thing they know to do. They think this is what's best. They're, they're not doing this as a because they're attacking you. This is what they think is best. So your options are to wear a mask and pray for them or not wear a mask and pray for them and have $800 ready. I said, <laughs> No, it's the same. The, let's get the fight out and you'll be much happier because you're not going to change it right now. And it took about a year. And one day we were talking. We met every week. He said, no, I think I'm just going to stop fighting this. Like I never said no. I said, I said that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to allow him time to come to that conclusion. And I didn't always handle that well, but I'll give myself a B plus on that one. He, but he enough. I gave him enough room to where he could find that. And, and that's the story in this about the fish in the water story. I think that's what that's talking about. And it, um, Mitchell doesn't use that story, but the others do. Fish cannot leave the depths. It says, this is, uh, this is Derek Lynn. The soft and weak overcome the tough and strong. Fish cannot leave the depths. The sharp instrument of the state cannot be shown to the people. So I don't know about the sharp instrument of the state, but I, the fish cannot leave the depths makes sense to me because when the fish gets curious of what's outside of the water, they get up in shallow, more shallow water so that they can see what's going on. And then they're able to get called. As long as they stay in the depths, they do not. That's not possible. Kerry? So I think that, uh, I think Stephen Mitchell does answer it. But you guys allowed me time to figure it out. Oh, thank you. Oh, in, yeah. <laughs> Kerry's got it. Tell us, Kerry, please. <laughs> in his last two, in his last two statements, like, so with the one that says just fish, just says fish hidden in deep waters. If you look at his second to last one, it says, let your workings remain a mystery. Because fish in deep waters are a mystery. You can't see them. Yes. And then it, uh, it is your, it's uh, and a country's weapon should not be displayed. So it's just show people the results. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You don't need to show them how you did it and why and how and everything. Just show them how. So I get, that's really a good AA statement, right? You share, share your experience, your strength and your hope so they can see the results of it. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. That's perfect. Uh, yeah. So I was like, I got excited. I was like, oh, he, it is answered there. <laughs> and you allowed me the time to figure it out. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's good. I guess if we're, our pride and ego could cause us to want to brag on how we're doing things, that would be bringing the fish into the shallow water, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or... or maybe using weapons or violence or w words to try to tell someone else the way they should live their life or what they should do instead of letting them figure it out. Let your workings remain a mystery. Just show people the results. 
Yeah, we share our experience, strength, and hope, Carrie, not our inexperienced weakness and despair. Yeah. Oh, that's hard sometimes. I have to remind myself of that. <laughs> my first sponsor drilled that in my head. He said that you share your experience, strength, and hope in the meeting. You don't have none of that yet. I'll tell you when you can talk. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't want to hear that. I was a successful guy with a new suburban and the lake house and all the stuff. Talks to me that way. You know, that kind of, <laughs> I was just under my breath. I was just, rawr, 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 rawr. My sponsor would say, is this the hill you want to die on? And I was like, if you say that to me one more time, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> when I got my first year after five years of in and out. So it had been, got my first year, six years in, I guess it was. Finally. First of all, I show up to get my chip on a night that's not my normal nights. And they give a one, they called for the one year chip and somebody got up and got a one year chip and they didn't call a second one. So I couldn't get mine the night of my chip. I'm like, I was just like, oh my, I was just pissed off. So I had to come back a second night, you know, that I didn't normally come to a meeting. And when I got my chip in my uh, home group, my sponsor's response was, Congratulations for doing what millions of people do every day with no fanfare whatsoever. You know, and my, response, <laughs> and my response to him was, fuck you. And I just turned around, and walked out, shot him a bird and walked out. That's what I mean. That's oh, that's what I did my first year of sobriety. I never did <laughs> that now, but I'm like, oh, my God. So immature. It just it's crazy. Hey, buddy, that one lands about as well as they tell them someone to go drink. When you tell someone congratulations for but my dog's got more sobriety than you, it does not go good in a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I used that one on Craig in about three years. He was bragging. He was putting in all of his stuff in a, in our in a group that we were in online. And I've got this awful picture of a dog with his eyebrows moving, a little uh, chihuahua and a little gif and uh I posted that and I said, my dog's got more sobriety than you. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't forgotten it either. <sighs> yeah. Well, I tried to use it and it didn't work. It was, it landed pretty flat. Online it's okay because people have time to ruminate on it, Carrie. You got to, you got to have the picture with it. That's the, uh, uh the important part I think we can take out of this too, number one, we have to learn to allow. And when I allow something, it's totally beyond my control. It's not based on my ego. It's not based on my abilities. It's not based on what I know, who I am, how successful I've been or not been. It's not, doesn't have anything to do with any of that. It has to do with me letting go. It's like, when you have that beach ball you're holding under the water, you just let, you just allow, just let it go. That's first in this. And then we learn that once we allow the results of that, the way it happens, we just, we don't brag about how we did it. We just show the results of us allowing really. And that keeps our ego out all around. First, if, if I did something other than allowing, I could brag about how I did it. And then here it's saying that we, the way it works, it remains a mystery because how can you explain that? How can you, you know, what I do when somebody compliments me on things, I used to get really nervous when people complimented me on something that I knew I did not accomplish. I get an email about the book or, or somebody t sees me in person. They, the first time someone told me I changed their life was like, that's the worst thing in the world you could have just said to me <laughs> because I want to go, wow, I did really, how did I change your life? You know, and I want to, you know, that kind of thing, but I realized, but what I did was I wanted to start backing up. Oh no, I could all that stuff. I just did not know how to handle those kind of compliments. Now I just say, thank you. I don't go into detail. I don't. And what I'm really doing, and I talk about, I think one verse in the book, I did this. When I say thank you, I'm not saying thank you to you. I'm just saying thank you to what is, to God, whatever, for that. You just are hearing it. 
because I know that nothing that's ever accomplished of any lasting benefit that changes someone's life, per se, came from me. That's not something I did. I do not have that capability. Only when I allow and step out of the way can I be used in that manner. And if I'm being used in that manner, it's not coming from Buddy. Buddy does not have that knowledge, does not have that ability. Everything about the practice of the Tao, studying any of this, and 12-step recovery is teaching us how to step out of the way. It's not teaching us how to do it. It's how to get out of the way and let it happen. It's been my experience. So, Like the St. Francis prayer, to make me a channel. Yes. <laughs> that I understand rather than be understood. Yes, Carrie. Yeah. Brian? I, I was just thinking I've got a, uh, what I call my surrender board in my closet. I put a bunch of things together that remind me of the word surrender. And man, I, you know, when I get dressed in the mornings, I, I try to just take a minute and just look at that and say, you know what, all I'm going to do is show up today and give my best effort. And I'm not going to walk out of this house and, and think I'm taking over the world. Yes. I just have to let go. Hmm. Yeah. Now, I had an instance uh, last week. One thing I've tried to, as far as in my program, I've got one sponsee and I, I've been, I've never been one of these guys that has, takes the time to have lunch once a week or coffee. And I thought I'm, man, I'm, I'm out hunting and gathering. I don't have time for that. And so I've got a new guy that I, I picked up and he'd asked me if we could get together for lunch. And I said, well, I'll have to let you know by next week. And so long story short, I was sitting there one day and I had nothing going on. And I thought well, I can either sit here and stare at this email and try to manifest something, which doesn't work. <laughs> or I can send this guy a text and say, Hey man, could you get, could you grab lunch? Uh, we ended up grabbing lunch and man, it was like the best use of my time. And, uh, it was what I needed, but he got me out of myself. Uh, and this guy shared some stuff with me, man. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. But the, but that's the disease, man. What it tells us that we're not good enough. And so, yeah, it's good stuff, man. This is why I'm here every week. Yeah, we're that channel. We're really more of a spigot than a channel in my thinking. We All this is within us, and we just don't know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we step out of the way and just let it go. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have to figure out how this works. If we allow, the rest of it takes care of itself. And I didn't notice this. The last little stanza is about the response. Our work is always in the allowing. And then the response to our work is the letting workings remain a mystery, just show people the results. Well, that's where I can get in trouble if I'm not careful, is just showing the results, showing my experience, strength, and hope. Not meditated this much for this many years. I've done this and this. At my last silent retreat we were you know no <laughs> i'm getting into shallow water when i start that kind of thing you know? i did that the other day buddy and i'm almost tempted to tell the story so i could do it again <laughs> right now <laughs> <laughs> but when you start doing some of those things if you're not careful you can move over into that pride and ego with it and every time you're moving into shallow water I remember the first time I went to a solid retreat, it was a multi-day, meditating all day, every day. And when I left, I was at first, I had some real pride about it. I was like, wow, I did this. Wow, I was able to, you know. But the good thing was, when I left, there were some things that were, came out of it that was good. But I did not feel that much different, which was a good thing, because that did not it didn't feed my ego from it like I thought that it would. 
Because who thinks they can go and meditate eight, nine hours a day for from Thursday night till Sunday morning? I mean, that just seems like so, it seems like a super spiritual person would be doing that. Not me. <laughs> and so I don't know. It, I think it's the same thing that sometimes when we reach those success hurdles and we've all had those hurdles that we've set and reached when I've reached those hurdles and attained whatever it was that I was looking for, I really didn't feel that much different. Hold that big check in my hand with lots of zeros on it that I'm fixing to put in the bank. I'm like, huh, I'm still buddy. I don't feel very much, feel very different. You know, even though I was going to be able to pay this off or pay that off, I still did not feel like the person I thought I would feel like when I was able to do that. I don't know if that makes sense, but it was the same way with spiritual things, too. I'm still buddy. Still buddy. No matter at the end of the day, man, it's just an inside job. You're always there dealing with yourself. And Brian, the key to that for me, if I don't get caught up in me thinking I'm the one that's the source of what's going on, if I can keep in a place of gratitude, I may can keep from moving up into that shallow water where I'm in trouble. Because and what's and another thing that this started, but another thing this guy said was he said, Man, I've been wanting to <clears throat> talk to you. He said, I've noticed how you share and how you carry yourself. And man, I carry a lot of shame because I'm not the most eloquent speaker. And we also go to another program together that is for couples. And he said, man, I really appreciate the things that you share in our couples meeting. And to be honest, I really try to watch what I say because my wife's in there because I have a lot of fear that I'm going to embarrass her, that I'm going to say something totally redneck and and she's going to be embarrassed. And so that just really struck me. I was like, man, <laughs> you're in bad shape if you're <laughs> impressed by me. I guess it's my energy. It's the work that I've done, but man, it did make me feel uncomfortable. It's the results, Brian. It's that yeah. strength and hope that we're talking hope, about. Yeah. 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 It's like I don't have to have some kind of brilliant answer. All I can share is what worked for me. And that is the brilliant answer, though. The yeah. The brilliant answer that's is it. not in the words. It, it, it's in, And that's how we share what God is, I think. Yeah. Is in our, God's in our experience. Love, compassion, never what words you want to put on it. That's in our experience. Mm -hmm. And we share God by sharing our experience because that's how it's worked for us. And if it worked for me, it can work for you too. Yeah. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Not giving it. Yeah. But I I even shared that this guy had never heard of the Tao Te Ching. And and I kind of shared a bit of my story and, uh, my background, I came from the church of Christ and he was able to share a, a pretty funny church of Christ joke. Uh, but it, anyway, it was, it was, I thought it was funny cause it's true. But anyway, saying that I told him about hearing you on a podcast and I said, man, this guy talks just like I do. It's got that Southern draw. And I'm like, what in the world is he talking about? So I started digging into it you know, and then it took me about a year to get here, but uh, you know, and I told him the most important part for me is, is I've been able to say, you know what? I don't know. I, I can take a little bit of a little bite from all these different areas and just be happy with that. Yes. Yes. I don't know. That was not part of my vocabulary before I got into recovery, Brian. Mm-hmm. I would never say, I don't know. I'd always have an answer for everything. It's what I tell my wife sometimes. I'll get on my high horse for a brief second, and I'll say, I'm going to stop because I'm a know-it-all, and I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say myself, Brian thinks he knows in Brian's world, but the rest of the world doesn't live in Brian's world, so I'm going to back my way down. <laughs> I like that one. I need to use that one a lot. 
<laughs> I've had sponsees that would ask me things and I wouldn't know how to respond. And I would tell, I tell them, Hmm, I don't have a tool to use with that. Let me check with my sponsor, see if they have some experience with this and let me sit with this. And maybe before I even call my sponsor within an hour or two, something will come to mind and I'll text them back or call my, have you considered trying this or doing this? And when we're open, like that is the allowing because we're not approaching things from this point, this fixed that we have it figured out. When we say we know it, we are blocking the possibility of a solution coming to us that's not our own that's not allowing and, and it, it works with everything yeah this is a good uh, a really good verse for us for me today so thank you guys we have to let that mud settle yes we have to allow whatever it is we're talking about stop the fight for me the way i stop the fight is okay how can i be helpful here how can I step out of the way? Instead of blocking the door, how can I hold the door open? That's basically what you're doing. Someone's trying to get through the door. Are you pushing and preventing them, or are you trying to hold the door open? The way I hold the door open is by finding a way to get compassion into the situation. That holds the door open. Then they can decide where they're going. But as long as I'm blocking them, I'm in the way. That's the way I look at it. Anything else, guys, before we close? Thank you for a good conversation today. Y'all have a great week. Good to see you. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Dow of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.